The church at Corinth is the church of all the churches Paul writes to that gets the most letters. You might think to yourself, oh, you got first and second Corinthians. We have uh, other churches that get multiple letters. No, we just don't have all the letters to, to the church at Corinth. There were at least four. We just happen to have two in the Bible. Like Paul writes to them often. They know what Paul knows, what they have been taught about what Jesus says about how to handle conflict. Yet they keep on having conflict and disagreement. They're just a church that fights with itself a lot. So they, they know, uh, as Paul did, as I said, it's in Matthew 5, that if you're on your way to even the most important event, worship at the temple, or today we would say something like on your way to Easter. If you are on your way to Easter and you realize you have hurt someone, you stop. You go get squared away with them, and then you can go to Easter worship. Now, that's how important getting squared away, getting reconciled, working through brokenness and hurt. Or, or it's in Matthew uh, 18, Jesus flips it around and says, if you have been hurt, you go to the person who hurt you, and you say, we got to get this squared away. And if necessary, you go get help, someone else from the church to help get it worked out. Like, Paul knows this, the church at Corinth knows this, and they are still just bickering and fighting and having these, these problems. And so what Paul writes in what we call 2 Corinthians is uh, that is Paul has to get through to them, like understanding that this is a way of life, not just like a one-time thing. He writes to them that we have been given a ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the word world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, but entrusting this message of reconciliation to us, to you, church, right? So we are ambassadors for Christ. That term has always just captured my imagination. We are ambassadors of Jesus Christ. It was true then, it's true today. It's a skill, this making of peace, and this, this skill, the making of peace with people with whom our relationships are broken, I consider it such an essential part of being church, of being people who follow Jesus, that it has been uh, the second sermon I preach at every church I've gone to. The first sermon is always Jesus is Lord, because that's where we start. And then the second sermon is always, now let's talk about reconciliation. We are ambassadors of reconciliation, the ministry of Jesus Christ, the kingdom. We are an outpost, an embassy of that kingdom, ambassadors of, of, for, the, king, for the, the king of kings, for Jesus. The thing about being an ambassador is that sometimes the work of being an ambassador is swift, challenging, but done in a very reasonable span of time. If I hurt a friend, if I offend my wife, right? if I forget to Skype my parents, or if I do something the, to hurt my children, right? it's probably not going to require extensive, extended efforts to rebuild what has been fractured. Right? And in those situations, the advice that Jesus offers is sufficient. It's direct, it's sufficient. If you've offended someone, go to them. If you have been offended, go to the person you've hurt and, and, or that hurt you and just like get it sorted out, right? No dancing around, like that's just what we're called to do. Those words are in red, you might say. Words of Jesus, do this, right? Yet sometimes life is, is shall we say, complicated. There are, are parts of our world that are not going to be resolved with one or two hard conversations. Sometimes ambassadorial work is more than just one event. Sometimes being an ambassador is a lifetime. Like Paul working with the church at Corinth, I'm sure he got tired of hearing, oh my lord, what are they fighting about this time? And then he went to work being an ambassador, working towards them with the ministry of reconciliation, right? Or like anyone who has followed Jesus across the centuries in a time that was challenging. You know, and the thing is, the more I learn about history, it's a little pet project of mine, I keep on trying to learn about different parts of history, different places, different centuries, is that every time I read about a century, or listen or learn about a century, it's always a complicated time 
to be a follower of Jesus. There's always something weird going on, whether it's church splitting for the first time in the 10th century or the 10, 11th century, 10, 10, uh, 1066, um, or whether it's uh, with the Black Plague or whether it's war, or whether it's Christianity is illegal under the Roman Empire early on. Like there's, It's always complex and weird and challenging to be Christian. It is always weird, and that includes today. I think it's impossible not to, to, I think it'd be impossible to read the news and not at some point have the response, wow, did that really just happen? Wow, is that really going on? Am I going crazy or is that just completely wackadoodle? Like, how can people do something that is that wrong? How can people do what is so obviously not in line with what God calls us to be and to do, right? I think the calling to be an ambassador right, still rings true. And to be clear, an ambassador is a long-term position. To be an ambassador is to be a servant working towards peace in the midst of conflict. And that's kind of where we live. There's a, a conflict. Uh, there was conflict in the church of Corinth, and there's been conflict ever, every century since. As I have thought about this calling... For Christians to be ambassadors, uh, to be p uh, pr representing Jesus to the culture around us here, in this place, in this time. It has struck me that um, we can split this work into two parts. It's true here, it's always been true. But the work of an ambassador, whether it's an ambassador of Christ or the ambassador from France to China, just picking two places, right? The first part of being an ambassador is to be firmly rooted in the place and the people they represent. All right? For the ambassador from France to China, whoever that is, they need to be French. They need to be able to go and represent France to, to China, right? And so they need to be profoundly, constitutively French, right? And, and for us as ambassadors of Christ, we need to be firmly Christian to be able to represent, represent, to present again, right? to present Jesus as we go forth into this world, into this culture that is just weird. Man. So first, to be firmly entrenched and rooted in the place we're representing. But also, the second part of being an ambassador is to be able, is to put the work in to understand where we're sent. The ambassador from France to China better know the Chinese language, Chinese history, and be able to order at a Chinese restaurant and do so competently. It's the same thing for us. If we go forth into this world, we go forth uh, in, in, to be involved in this, this world. And, and, and it, these are two halves of, of, of the work of being an ambassador. And if, you skew, if, if one skews too far towards one way, uh, it can become isolationist, right? To, if the French person is so French that they don't bother to learn Chinese, like they're, they're not going to be a good ambassador. Oh, the same thing. If, if the church, if we're, rep, if we're trying to represent Christ and we never get outside the church, then we, we okay, we become isolationists. But on the other side, I think the term you might say would be a going native, right? That uh, it, it, you can get so enmeshed and in, in wrapped up in the world that you're, you're being sent to, whether it's China or whether it's the world around us as ambassadors of, ambassadors of Christ, that, that we lose our rootedness in what we're trying to bring, bring with us, if that, that makes sense. And so to, to be an ambassador, to be working towards peace, is to be working towards peace between two politics, two kingdoms that, that disagree, France and China, or it's uh, the kingdom of God with Jesus as king and the world we live in today that, that does not acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. Right? And how, how do we do this? How do we walk this path? How do we find this road where we are sufficiently rooted in following Jesus so that we are representing him to the world, but also involved in the world that we're, that's around us so that we're not having become so isolationist that we don't make an impact, that we don't matter? Right? How do we walk this path? There is a place in Scripture, I think, we can look. As we look across, it's, I think of this happening more in the Old Testament. As we look through the Old Testament, there are these moments that we can look at and say, ah, 
That is how we struggle with this situation. When, when we need to learn something new and become people who are changed and different, we can look at like how Exodus, the time in the wilderness, can teach us. If we want to look for ways that we need to critique, become, become comfortable with critique, we can look towards the prophets, right? And, and so these are sort of ways of, of living that we can look at in the Old Testament. And if we want to look for someone who had to walk the path between two cultures and to hold on to a faith, but also stay Staying involved in the culture around them, I think we can look at someone like Daniel. I think we can look at someone like, like Daniel. Someone who is faithful, even, being, even while being involved in this weird situation. And so what's the weird situation that Daniel's in? Let's, let's read the book from the, from the beginning of the book of Daniel. We, we read, then the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord let King Jehoiakim of Judah fall into his power, as well as some of the vessels of the house of God. These he brought to the land of Shinar and placed in the treasury of his gods. Then the king commanded his palace master, Ashpenaz, to bring some of the Israelites of the royal family and of the nobility, young men without physical defect and handsome, versed in every branch of wisdom, endowed with knowledge and thought, competent to serve in the king's palace. They were to be taught the literature and language of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily portion of the, of the royal rations of food and wine. They were to be educated for three years so that at the end of that time they could be stationed in the king's court. Among them was Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah from the tribe of Judah. The palace master gave them other names. Daniel he called Belteljazar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the royal rations of food and wine, so he asked the palace master to allow him not to defile himself. Now God allowed Daniel to receive favor and compassion from the palace master. And so it goes on, and we, we would read that to, Daniel lives on, on vegetables and beans and vegetables and, and he doesn't drink the wine or he doesn't eat the meat that would have been offered to him as part of the king's household. And so we would say with well, Daniel is sticking to a kosher diet. Recent, kosher diet. Recently we looked at Esther and we, we might say that like he's doing like Esther did, but actually that gets it backwards. Esther was probably following in Daniel's footsteps because Esther... It's within the realm of possibility that Daniel was an old man when Esther became queen, and so it could be that the, the, that's the order, that Esther gets that idea from, from Daniel. I don't know. But uh, the point being, Daniel holds on to something about being Jewish. There's a practice about being Jewish, and, and part of the practice of being Jewish, so part of his faith, part of the basics of being a Jewish person is how you eat. And he's going to hold on to that kosher way of life. He is not going to eat the meat of Babylon. He is not going to eat the meat that was probably and almost certainly for sacrifice, part of an animal sacrifice to pagan gods. And so he's going to hold on to this is what makes, this is going to be, this is what I'm holding on, this is what I'm rooted in, my Jewishness. I'm going to be rooted in what I eat, that part, that part of my way of life. And then he is educated. And you notice he's educated again. When he came to Babylon, he was already educated, which is why Babylon took him. But he is educated again for another three years, right? And, and, and that's kind of, in a sense, He's unintentionally doing what ambassadors do. He's learning the language. He's learning the culture. He's learning the history, even while holding on to something essential being rooted in what's making him Jewish. And so he seeks the good of the place he is sent. This is something that the exiles had been told to do by the prophet Jeremiah. It's in Jeremiah 29. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat what they produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, right? Take wives for your sons, give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there, do not decrease. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you. And pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. 
Right? And so we find Daniel as he's doing the work of the ambassador. He is holding on to what makes him Jewish, even while being educated about the ways of the place he has been sent. He is going to seek to hold on to the future and the goodness of the Jewish people while working for the good of the Babylonian people too. And, and so he's working for the good of, of both. Right? Finding the balance between the two it's not really a simple question of how, there's no, it's not a simple question to answer, right? It, it's because they could have gone other ways. What Daniel and, and the other three did is they hold, held on to their diet, it, but they accepted the Babylonian name because they were told, here's your new name as a Babylonian, right? Uh, and, and they could have rejected that. They could have said, no, we're not even, we, we can't do that. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego Right? They could have said uh, that we're, we're not going to take those because Meshach is a form of the word Mithra, which is a, a Babylonian god. You may have heard of the cult of Mithra, if you've ever studied a little bit about the history of that time. Or Abednego is uh, Abed, means servant, and Nego is the name of the Babylon, Babylonian god of wisdom. Right? So they, they accepted these new names that they could have viewed as heretical. Well, I mean, they probably did view as heretical. But, but they, they found this sense of like, we're going to hold on to this, we'll hold, we'll hold on to what keeps us rooted in being Jewish, and we're going to be flexible on, on that. And if you read, continue to read through the first seven chapters of Daniel, you'll find that like, they're going to stand firm on their faith. You, we're going to eat what we choose to eat as Jews, and we're not going to bow to any pagan idols. You can call us whatever name you want, but we're not going to... Call us by a name that involves an idol, but we're not going to bow to an idol. All right? That's, that's the stance. Could they have taken a different stance? Could they have eaten whatever was offered but rejected the name? Like maybe that's, they could have done that. I, I don't know, but like, that's kind of getting at the point that there's no simple answer to how to do both sides of being an ambassador, being rooted in the place from which we are sent, but also being flexible and being involved in the place to which we have sent. Right? There's no easy answer to then, and there's no easy answer today. How, how do we go forth from this church to represent Jesus, being ambassadors of the, the good news of Jesus Christ out there, being flexible enough, but not so flexible that we turn into like jello and just let everything, anything slide, without being so insistent that we have to do things my way and my way and this is the way because if it, I'm a Christian and this is why I'm representing Christ and we have to do it my way because that, that's the right way, right? Without being so insistent that we turn into to jerks. No easy answers. What, what's the middle way, the way of an ambassador? Got to figure it out. Right? What is the modern equivalent of Daniel's stance? Daniel's stance of holding on to the diet. So like, this is what makes me Jewish. I'm going to be rooted in this. But also saying, yeah, call me whatever you want. That's fine, right? Well, what's that look like today? I have a few hesitant and, frankly, humble, hopefully useful thoughts on this, right? Maybe what we hold on to as followers of Jesus in a culture that cares less and less about long-term commitment Maybe simply getting and staying married matters. Showing people that marriage has the potential to be the best way to spend life with a person you love in a healthy marriage is the most stable place to raise children. And yes, life is complicated and divorces happen and anyone who's raising a, a child by themselves as a single parent, like, oh my, my hat's off to you. Like, I am in awe of you. If I can help you in any way, please let me know. Like, wow, that's amazing. But like, just to say like this, this is something we acknowledge. Marriage, monogamy, fidelity, commitment to family. Right, that's something we couldn't stay rooted in in the rest of the culture that, frankly, is losing its touch with that. Maybe, maybe what we stay rooted in is prayer. Right? We stay rooted in praying. We, before we eat a meal, whether we're at home or we're going out to a meal, whether before a game starts, when, when someone we love is hurting, we're at a hospital or, or gathered together, right? And, and no, no one is going to get on the loudspeaker and lead the crowd in the Lord's Prayer, praying for the safety of athletes before a game begins. But we can. Right? And frankly, I'm going to tell you, there's always going to be prayer in schools because there's always going to be tests. 
And there is no one who can stop me or anyone else from bowing our head and saying, oh my God, help me remember this on the test. Help, amen. Right? Yeah, that's just, yeah. And my teachers aren't going to be able to lead those prayers anymore. But that's okay. We can still pray wherever we are. We don't need anyone's permission to stop and to pray. Maybe we keep on finding people that are different than us and cultivate friendships and allow people to be different. Maybe we care about life at all stages, from the youngest to the oldest. Maybe we keep on telling the truth even when it's not comfortable for people we want to support. Maybe we keep on volunteering to help when it only gets harder and harder to get by and to find the time to do so. Like maybe what, whatever it is that we choose to, like, there are these simple practices of being Christian, of following Jesus. And none of this, none of what I've just said is surprising or crazy, but frankly, it's not crazy for Daniel, a Jew, to say, like, what I'm going to hold on to is my diet. Call me but whatever name you want, but I'm going to eat like a Jew. Right? For a Jew to eat kosher isn't all that crazy. And that is where Daniel began his work as an ambassador. He held on to what made him Jewish. And my friends, as we face a culture in which the basics of faith the basic practices, practices of faith are becoming increasingly rare. Holding on to those basics of faith is where we begin as well. So that we are rooted in what makes us who we are. That is, followers of Jesus Christ. For us to be ambassadors of Christ, and we'll talk about what it means to go out in his name in, in later sermons, right? But for us to begin to say we are going to be ambassadors of Christ begins with us being rooted in Christ, so that when, when we go out, we have something to offer, something significant, something of substance, something that is different than the world around us. As different as Daniel holding on to a simple diet in a, culture, in, in a place in that, in that kingdom, in that, around the king where everyone is being gluttonous, as simple as us continuing to pray and to gather and to serve when those around us aren't. That's where we begin, rooted in what makes us Christian. Then we can go forth as ambassadors in his name. Amen.